So the data shows it helps frequency, it helps urinary urgency, it helps all interstitial cystitis symptoms and pelvic pain and pain with sex. If you have a weak orgasm, that should get better as well. Hi, welcome back to the channel. My name is Melissa and today at Live UTI Free, we're talking about UTI and hormones. We have another amazing guest, Dr. Rachel Rubin, and in our conversation, we're going to cover things like estrogen therapy, contraceptives and hormone replacement therapy at any stage of life. I also wanted to mention that we have many other resources for patients experiencing recurrent and chronic UTI, and we've linked to some of those in the video description below. Lastly, if you enjoyed these videos, think they're important and want to support what we do, make sure you click subscribe and tick the bell so you'll be notified of videos when we post them. And other than that, thanks again for joining us on this journey to making change in women's health. Today, we're very lucky to have Dr. Rachel Rubin with us, who is a board certified urologist and sexual medicine specialist, among many other things. She also shares our passion for patient education. Thanks so much for joining me today to answer our community's questions. I am so thrilled to be here. Thank you for having me. Amazing. I would love it first if you can give us a bit more information about your background and how you came to specialize in sexual medicine. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm a urologist, which is uh, in the United States, you do four years of medical school. It's five years of training as a urologist, which is surgical training in kidneys and bladders and prostates and urethras. Uh, in I wish more vulvas, uh, but that's another mm -hmm. story. Yeah. Uh, and then after my five years of training, I did a one-year fellowship in something called sexual medicine. So we take care of all genders and I deal with issues like pelvic pain, hormone issues, libido, orgasm, arousal. Um, and I see, I always joke, I always see the the weird and the wacky, the things nobody else really quite sees very much of, the medication-induced sexual dysfunctions, um, the things people don't like to talk about. Uh, mm -hmm. And yeah, and so I started my own practice about eight months ago in the Washington, D.C. area in the United States. Great. That's great. Then you're the perfect person to answer the questions. And we, we get a lot of questions about different symptoms that many people don't experience. And we have a whole bunch of questions on hormones, but I wanted to start with a few on anatomy that came up, which could provide a good foundation for some of the questions that come later. Um, so the first question was, are there similarities between the lining of the bladder and the uterus? Uh, that's a great question. Um, and so it's different. The lining of the bladder is endoderm. Actually, this is a good question. I don't know if I know the answer to this. Yeah. The lining of the bladder is endoderm. The lining of the vagina is mesoderm. Um, the lining of the uterus is um, um, endometrium, which I don't know. It's different tissue because the endometrial tissue is is very special. Um, so I'm not a gynecologist, but this is a, a, I don't believe they are the same tissue. Um, but that is a very good question. I thought it was an interesting one too. The second one was about the bladder itself and what the term trigonitis means and it's what it means in association with UTI. Yeah, so the bladder trigone is where um, the bottom, so if the bladder, if you think of it like a bowl, uh, when you're standing up, it's like a bowl. The bottom of the bowl is where all the urine pools and then there's two little holes at the bottom where the urine then um, uh, uh, the urine comes into from the ureters and then goes out through the urethra. So it's at that bottom where the urine is coming in and it's leaving where everything's happening. That we call the trigone. So sort of like the bottom area. And it's, um, and so it can look inflamed, uh, and, and irritated. And we often call that trigonitis. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes they can have little lesions on it. When we look visually that can call, be called cystitis cystica. Um, there's things like squamous, met squamous metaplasia. There's all sorts of visual and biopsy proven irritants, chronic inflammation, ulcerations, uh, infectious, you know, things where you have a UTI, what it looks like on, mm -hmm. on, on, on scoping. Um, yeah. So that means trigonitis itself is the inflammation and it could be caused by a UTI or it could be caused by a number of other things. Yeah. And there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of non-specificness to mm -hmm. it and which frustrates the hell out of everyone mm -hmm. in your group as it should, yeah. because there is so much, gosh, I, I was speaking with a, a pathologist on the phone yesterday. I have a patient who has these horrible vulvar lesions that we cannot figure out. I biopsy or I biopsy or I biopsy or, and it keeps coming back as chronic inflammation. And, mm -hmm. and, and the pathologist, I said, well, it has to be something. It has to be something. Well, it's just chronic inflammation. I'm going to offer you thoughts and prayers. And I was like, I, I can't. I just th thoughts and prayers are not going to help my patient mm -hmm. uh, figure this out. That is a source of frustration among our group. Definitely the, the 
topic of trigonitis has come up recently and it's sort of given as a diagnosis, but it really means that you should be looking for the root cause, it seems. And so one of the questions associated with that is, are there symptoms that would indicate that the inflammation could be in the trigone area as opposed to somewhere else in the bladder? Yeah, it's certainly anything's all options are on the table, right? In terms of what is causing it. And, and so that's when we think about it is, is the inflammation in the tissue level? Is there a bacteria in the urine that's causing it? Is it in the lining of the of the walls of the bladder? Is it coming from somewhere else? Is the vagina a, a microbiome leading to it? Is it even an infection at all? Which even mm -hmm. that is a huge controversial topic mm -hmm. that I'm sure at some point today, I'll have tomatoes thrown at me because there's so much we're just not sure about. And so so sometimes our testing and our terminology is beyond our ability to treat it and, and wave our magic wands to make everybody feel better. And that's where so much frustration lies. Yeah, it would be great to be able to get some more answers. Um, but I guess the main topic we want to cover today is about estrogen therapy. So we can move into some of those questions. I thought it would be helpful to start with an explanation of the link between estrogen and bladder health. I love this, is my favorite topic. So <laughs> this one I can handle. Um, so this is really important. And this actually could explain some of the trigonitis stuff. I really believe that. So if everyone can think about a baby girl, okay, anyone who's ever changed the diaper of a baby girl, right? Baby girls have teeny tiny labias. Their vulvas are red, raw, and irritated. They pee in their diapers constantly. Mm -hmm. Now they don't complain of bladder pain or UTIs, but they're also not putting anything in their vaginas. They're not... Uh, uh, um, we're not uh, uh, poking and prodding at this area very much to introduce bacteria. And so um, we even put diaper cream all over it because it looks so raw and painful. Babies have no hormones in their bodies, no estrogen, no testosterone. The tissue is very hormone sensitive. We are rich in estrogen receptors and androgen receptors, both in the urethra, in the bladder, in the vulva, in the vulvar vestibule. And without hormones, the tissue is very raw, thin, and irritated. So then baby girls go through puberty. They become very mean to their mothers, as I like to say. Uh, but then, you know, their bodies literally change and transform, right? The tissue gets thicker, it gets uh, pink, it gets healthy, um, uh, the vagina acidifies so that it can fight infection. And so it's a hormonal response. The tissue is very hormonal. Mm -hmm. And as I always like to say, when you play with hormones, there are consequences. Sometimes they're very good and sometimes they're very bad, but there are consequences. And so th for things like birth control pills or um, breastfeeding or, or breast cancer medications, or of course, menopause, which is the thing we see the most, what happens is you lose hormones. And so the tissue starts to thin, it starts to involute, it starts to get dry and cracks and gets irritated. And it can't mount a healthy response to bacteria the way healthy tissue would. And so in my opinion, and what I'm trying to change the, the, um, um, the narrative on all of this is hormones are the baseline. Hormones are the foundation. Hormones mm -hmm. are a must for everybody. Uh, and if you don't have that, not, I think all the other treatments are third line therapy compared to first and second line therapy being hormones. And so you can't in your groups, you can't have women say, I failed vaginal hormones and nothing's working for me. They must be on vaginal hormones. And it, it's not every type of vaginal hormone is right for every person, but they must be on that therapy as a baseline. And then the additional therapies can be, that doesn't mean that's the only therapy, but it's like the foundation of the house without it, mm -hmm. nothing else is going to, is going to work very well. Does that make sense? Sense. Definitely makes sense. And it kind of lays a base for most of the questions later, which is great. So you talked about vaginal health. Why is that important for bladder health and for reducing UTIs? Absolutely. So the it's it's all one microbiome kind of a thing. And there's lots we need to learn about the microbiome. But the only thing in the world that has shown to make a healthy microbiome and acidify the vagina to prevent urinary tract infections is vaginal hormones. So vaginal estrogen and actually vaginal DHEA. We have a paper that I it's in my email. I have to review it. <clears throat> but we looked at a paper where we also looked at vaginal DHEA, which does decrease the incidence mm -hmm. of UTIs as well. And so um 
the what happens is the vagina as it remember has receptors for estrogens and androgens without the hormones you lose the acidity of the vagina the lactobacilli all the good bacteria and so the bad bacteria start to overgrow and remember the urethra is right in that vulva and so it's only four you know four centimeters long and so the bacteria can crawl into it and then all the antibiotics can lead to antibiotic resistance and i don't have to tell your your listeners you know all of the the the, the difficulties of just getting more and more antibiotics. Um, and so the vaginal hormones are not a treatment for a UTI, but they're a preventative and a protector. And so that your body can now mount a response. So if you use vaginal hormones, it acidifies the tissue, the vagina mm -hmm. becomes healthier, uh, able to fight infection. And actually it's not just for the vagina, that, that a little bit of hormone also it will heal the urethra and will also uh, lead to bladder health as well. So the data shows it helps frequency. It helps urinary urgency. It helps all interstitial cystitis symptoms symptoms and pelvic pain and pain with sex. If you have a weak orgasm, that should get better as well. Um, and so it helps so many things, but the most important thing vaginal hormones do is prevent UTIs. And, and I can't stress that enough. I need your 89 year old grandmother on vaginal hormones. I need your 98 year old great grandmother on vaginal hormones. It is so safe. It is safe for all patients. There is really the only patient on earth I would even have an extra conversation with is someone who had active breast cancer on an aromatase inhibitor specifically, actually to, uh, any tamoxifen is fine. Uh, and that patient have a discussion, but I would convince that patient why it was safe and why UTIs are way more dangerous than the negative, the no risk of any kind of breast cancer issues. And so those are the only patients where it's even a conversation. Mm -hmm. If you have a history of blood clots, if you have a family history of cancer, if you have any, none of it matters. Vaginal hormones are safe. That was one of the questions that was going to come up later, but maybe we can address it now. Why are there so many fears around the use of estrogen if you have breast cancer or a family history of breast cancer? Politics, politics, politics. And it's so infuriating. So uh, basically... The at least in America, we have a box labeling on our vaginal hormone products that are the same box labeling that's essentially on what's on 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 birth control style pills that we give to women in menopause. They're very different products. They don't do the same thing, but they have the same warning labels on them. That warning label is not actually based in up to date data. The warning label says it causes stroke, heart attack, blood clots, dementia, breast cancer. You have to use it with progesterone. There is zero data to go with that box. Box, and yet the FDA, and if the FDA is listening or if someone at the FDA or someone is married to someone at the FDA, please let them listen. They're not interested in nuance. It would be like saying that condom wrappers should have a warning uh, risk of blood clots, right? Everyone knows birth control pills have a slight increased risk of blood clots. So that should mean that every contraception should have a box labeling that says cause blood clots. So right. your IUD, your diaphragm, uh, your condoms should all say that they cause blood clots. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. Neither does it make any sense that uh, a, a hormone therapy is not all the same thing in menopause. And local low dose vaginal estrogen or DHEA has zero risk of bad things happening to you. And so the politics are huge here, but the data, there is no, and, and I have been screaming on social media, on Twitter, on Instagram, on LinkedIn, screaming about this mm -hmm. for five years actually six years now, and no one's been able to present me with one piece of data to show that there should be fear with vaginal hormones. Not one. I encourage you all to try and I will meet you uh, on a, a de debate stage on the internet because mm. it just doesn't, it doesn't exist. Do you think there's any chance those guidelines or labels will be changed? I absolutely think we have to keep trying and mm -hmm. the advocacy work that you are all doing is actually even more important. It is, I believe it is patient advocates that get shit changed, excuse my language, <laughs> in this world um, because we're doing a terrible job. Uh, a group of doctors did go to the FDA a couple years ago mm -hmm. uh, and uh, sent a citizen's petition and uh, the FDA changed the conversation, made it about systemic hormones and said, no, we're not changing the box label. 
mislabeling and it was infuriating. And so we need a few um, motivated folks to go out there and really get angry and make this the issue. And so I would love to join all of you in marching down on Washington because I tell you, people are not marching uh, for vaginas. They're not marching yeah. for that. They're, they're, they're va the vaginal estrogen is all, never anyone's number one priority, but it should be because the number of people who are dying of urinary tract infections or urosepsis yeah. or, you know, it, it, or antibiotic resistance, we would save the healthcare system so much money by investing in vaginal hormone products. Every nursing home patient, uh, it's so important and it's so easy, which is why it's totally, totally ignored. Yeah, I, we find the same thing. I'm sure we could get a few people together if you want to organize that. Let's do it. That sounds <laughs> fun. But the topic of estrogen comes up a lot. But what about other hormones? Is there a link between progesterone or testosterone and bladder health? Absolutely. And we need more data. Um, so uh, that, just like I said, I have a paper sitting in my email that shows that vaginal DHEA prevents mm -hmm. urinary tract infections. What I love about vaginal DHEA, it's the only FDA approved product in the United States that has an androgen in it. And so we know that there are androgen receptors there. Mm -hmm. And I love to see more research on testosterone specifically for bladder health, because I am certain there is a role. Um, and we just, the problem is again, politics, we don't have FDA approved testosterone for women in the United States. And so it becomes more difficult to do studies, to know what doses to play mm -hmm. around with, and to get companies to kind of buy into this and understand the important link here. Uh, vaginal DHEA is a wonderful product, but it's hard to get into patients' vaginas because the expense of with insurance companies. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's very frustrating. Um, I think uh, progesterone is an even more unknown topic. Uh, I saw a recent uh, abstract that there are progesterone receptors in the vulva our vestibule, which mm -hmm. to me means there's probably progesterone receptors in the urethra and the bladder. And right. so it's just never, as far as I know, and I don't know everything, it hasn't been looked at with any a significant degree. But for all those women uh, in your group who say, man, my bladder symptoms really fluctuate with my cycle, of course, there's it's hormonally related. It has to have some hormone connection. Um, and so I couldn't agree more that that's a, a, an exciting uh, future place of research. Is that the same case? A few people mentioned progesterone pellets not being FDA approved, but finding them beneficial. Is it the same thing, just a lack of data? Pellets in general are a controversial topic because they are an FDA approved products, you know, and my, my frustration with them is if the pellets are so great and the companies are so proud of their safety, their efficacy, mm -hmm. and I'm not saying it doesn't work, but if they're so proud and the patients are so happy, why not do the work to, to, to do scientific studies to a high standard and get your products approved by the FDA. Other companies do it. Mm -hmm. Why do you think like, and so that's where my problem with it is, is why don't we hold? And, and so you could have dangerous things put in there because no one, there's no oversight. And so that's my issue with it. I love, we have, we have an FDA approved male a testosterone pellet. It's fabulous. Uh, if I could get it in more patients, I would. It's always, it's sometimes not always easy with insurance. And so I love the idea of pellets, but no one's studying it at a mm -hmm. rigorous level. And if these companies have so much money and are doing such a great job and they think they're doing such a great thing, then we should hold them to that high standard of saying, why don't we go through the process and actually do what's right for women? And it's my issue with it. Yeah, we would love that if more research was done in this space, definitely. It's what, what are the indicators that might prompt you to instigate estrogen therapy for a patient? If it is a patient who has a vagina. Uh, that's it, right? You need, must have vagina. No, so so uh, anybody over forty five. So if you're mm -hmm. anyone over forty five, uh, and you have any symptoms, so so I I I'm very aggressive um, because it doesn't hurt anyone. Vaginal estrogen has never hurt a fly. Occasionally, when you start it, you as your microbiome acidifies, you can get a yeast infection or a thrush infection. You treat it, it goes away. It's not something that creates a chronic uh, a yeast a situation, right? Uh, but it can happen. That is the worst thing that happens with vaginal hormones. Now, if you don't like the cream, switch to a tablet. If you don't like the tablet, switch to a ring. If you don't like the ring, switch to DHEA. There are different forms and sometimes the base or what it's in or the modality is not right for you, but you mm -hmm. have to find a product that works for you. Anyone over 45, I believe should be on it for preventative care, but mm -hmm. that's very aggressive. That's a very aggressive statement that I know not everybody agrees with. But what I think is I don't want you to have urinary frequency and urgency, and I don't want you to get a UTI and I don't want 
sex to become painful. And I don't want to treat you once your orgasm has already become muted. I want to prevent all of those things from happening. So I believe that early in perimenopause, we should all be encouraging vaginal hormone therapy. Now, uh, we need more data when it comes to premenopausal women. Uh, mm-hmm. Vaginal hormones will not hurt you. They will not change your cycle. They will not uh, hurt your partner. They will they will only uh, help locally. Now, if you're on birth control pills, I don't have much data. And my my impression is it's it's sometimes they counterbalance each other. Mm-hmm. And so it's hard to it's hard to fully help that microbiome. And so I I tend to like IUDs for that reason. It is it, it seems to be a little less caustic on the microbiome and on the tissue. Mm -hmm. we're still learning. Um, We need more data. We treat young babies with labial adhesions with vaginal estrogen. We give this stuff to babies. It is so safe for everybody. And yet uh, it is so under discussed because we hate the word vagina and we cannot handle uh, uh, the terminology. I actually think the terminology vaginal dryness is killing women because Mm. we minimize vaginal dryness doesn't sound like a big deal, right? Oh, just suck it up, lady. You got vaginal dryness. Just take that. I saw a woman in my office yesterday. She couldn't sit. She could not sit. She could not wear pants. She was miserable. She is so miserable. She needs, uh, she's had inpatient psychiatric care because of how much pain she is Mm -hmm. in in her vulva. This is not vaginal dryness, people. This is horrific and it's hormonally mediated. It does seem from our perspective that the quality of life is just not taken seriously. If it doesn't kill you, then you just have to deal with it. That's kind of the message we're getting from many people in this sphere but quality of life is so important to our community that's everything and there were a couple of questions about you mentioned that there aren't really side effects to this but a few people said they have experienced burning or pain is that because of the estrogen or the type that they're using it's typically the type they're using a couple things there and so uh, if you're using a cream and i i don't love creams the I, the reason i don't love creams is a couple reasons one they're messy and goopy and gloppy and this is mm-hmm. something that you have to do forever so if you hate putting goopy creams in your vagina it's really hard Hard for me to say, do this twice a week till death do you part. Uh, and so the creams also sometimes have um, chemicals in them that can be very irritating and caustic mm-hmm. to the tissue. Premarin cream, which I don't even think is available in Europe, but for some God unknown reason, we still have it in the United States and so many people prescribe it, has alcohol in it. It mm. has chemicals in it that are raw, that irritate. Um, and also um, uh, it's like they like torture horses to make it happen. But I don't love those creams. Now, if the creams are the only option you get, the only affordable choice that you have, then yes, use the creams. They're so much better than using nothing. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, The other side effects, again, as I said, you can get a yeast infection that can pop up. The creams are a little bit, if you use the creams, you want to make sure you dose it properly. This is a very common mistake that is not your fault. It is all the doctors who tell you, uh, I try to educate, I'm working on educating all of the doctors because they say, take a pea size of the cream cream and just rub it on your urethra, just Mm -hmm. a tiny bit of cream on the outside. It's not enough to acidify the vagina. And so if you really want to know if it's working, get a pH paper uh, and see if your vagina is four and a half pH. You got to get the pH of the vagina to four and a half. And so um, that's really important because the the urologist and the urogynecologist and the gynecologist are saying, just take a little pea size and it's wrong. It just, Mm -hmm. it's not enough. And so that's why I like the vaginal estradiol tablets, uh, tablet inserts, the 10 micrograms. I like the rings that uh, stay in for three months at a time. I like the DHEA inserts because you don't have to think about it, dose mm-hmm. anything out and wonder, am I using enough? And they're not goopy and messy. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Is the, are the tablet something you would use every day or is that a twice a week? You use them. Too? It's twice. So every day for two weeks and then twice a week. The DHEA are, are written for every day. Although I certainly do have patients who do it two or three times mm-hmm. a week and think that that's enough, but they were studied as every day. Occasionally you'll see a woman who has has breast tenderness. And that is not breast cancer. It does not mean you have breast cancer. Think of when, uh, if you've ever been pregnant, that very first sign of, oh my gosh, I'm pregnant is breast tenderness. And you say, you don't run to say, oh my God, I have breast cancer. I must go get a a mammogram right away. You run to your, your, uh, a drugstore and you get a pregnancy test. And you said, is this it? Is this the, you know, is this the time I'm pregnant? That typically goes away. What happens is a very, your tissues are so thin. They're so raw. They're so cracked that the littlest bit of estrogen um, you know, goes in uh, the bloodstream and, mm-hmm. and your your nipples get stimulated. But as it builds up in the tissue, um, uh, as it as the tissue builds up, um, 
it no longer goes into your bloodstream and you don't get the nipple tenderness anymore. It's rare, but I have seen patients have it. Okay. And so once you do start on that therapy, how long does it typically take to alleviate symptoms? It, this is the best question because people, we're women, we're used to an antibiotic for a week Mm -hmm. uh, for our UTIs or a one day uh, Diflucan for our yeast infection. Rome was not built in a day. It takes two to three months to build up the tissue, two to three months to make it strong and healthy, two to three months to acidify, to uh, make sex not painful again. And that's step one. So you're not going to see benefit for two to three months. So Mm -hmm. don't expect it. You got to refill it. You got to take it forever. It will stop working if you stop using it. Uh, The other thing to know is that, um, what was I going to say? It takes two to three months to start, start working. Oh, if you still have pain, that doesn't mean it's not working. It means that you may need an additional androgen to the tissue. Cause remember, mm-hmm. it's not just an estrogen story. It may mean that you need a pelvic floor physiotherapist to work on your muscles because underneath that angry tissue is thick muscles that really get tight and tender. Just like if you put your hand on a hot stove, your muscles are going to pull away. And so you need often a physiotherapist to really help you work on those muscles. Um, and do rehab. It's rehab. And we don't think of it like that. Yeah, it makes sense. So a lot of people in our community are seeing a pelvic physical therapist. So that's something that a lot of Yay! people have covered already. Yeah, And we also have interviewed a few of them on our channel. And um, there were a few questions around whether people who are estrogen dominant or have endometriosis can use topical estrogen therapy. Absolutely. It's a great question. They can certainly try it and it will not. Um, remember, when you use local estrogen or DHEA therapy, it does not go through your bloodstream. Let's talk mm-hmm. numbers here, people, because I think numbers make people less scared. If you draw my blood right now, okay, depending on where I am in my cycle, mm-hmm. my es- and we're going to talk picograms per uh, milliliter, picograms, that's the what we do in the United States. My estrogen level is going to be somewhere between 50 and 150. Okay, just to give you an idea, 50 and 150. My husband's estrogen levels are 25, okay? When I was pregnant with my kids, my estrogen level was probably about Mm 3,000, 3,000. That's pretty damn high, right? Like uh, really high. Um, When I go into menopause, my estrogen level will be zero, zero, right? My husband will will get to keep having more estrogen Mm -hmm. than I will, although I doubt I'll ever let my estrogen get to zero. Let's be real. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll put a patch on myself, but... um, but with, with endometriosis, when you use vaginal hormones, your estrogen stays zero in your bloodstream. You can check your labs. It stays zero. It stays in menopausal levels. So if your estrogen, if you have endometriosis and your estrogen is fluctuating between 50 and 150, if you add vaginal hormones, it stays between 50 and 150. It doesn't mm-hmm. change your estrogen levels. There is no reason to believe it would grow endometriosis or it would change endometriosis in any way. Certainly people with endometriosis try to get pregnant and their estrogens are three thousand and that happens all the time and so i think there's this fear of the word estrogen there's this fear of the word hormones and you have to understand that hormones are not all the same thing they are not all good they are not all bad if you've done badly with birth control pills that doesn't mean you would do badly with vaginal estrogen because they're Mm -hmm. totally different things Um, if an iud wasn't right for you that has nothing to do with vaginal hormones so you have to understand that there's a lot of nuance here There's also a lot of misinformation around endometriosis, which is part of the problem. Well, it's not just mis. Yes, there's a ton of misinformation, but there's it's 2022 and we have crap research, right? Mm -hmm. Like we don't have it figured out yet. PCOS, endometriosis. And so there's so many, you know, people trying to make these giant claims without the data to back Mm -hmm. it up. And we must hold we must hold our scientists accountable and say we need good data because there's a lot of people peddling not real stuff out there. That's definitely true. For people that don't want to use estrogen therapy, are there non-hormonal approaches to vaginal dryness that you can suggest? I would really try to convince them. I will always try to convince them that hormones is the right answer for Mm -hmm. them because they can't find a data point to tell me that they're dangerous. And so I always encourage them, follow my social media, watch what other people are saying. There is no, uh, you know, give it a try, change the modality. Vaginal DHEA is a great choice. So DHEA is, you can get it at um, any uh, uh, supplement center. You 
can see DHEA. It's a quote unquote supplement, right? Uh, this We have an FDA approved option, which is just call it a supplement and put it in your vagina. It's a precursor hormone, right? It's the mm-hmm. precursor to estrogen and testosterone. So DHEA would be a great option for that person who's okay. afraid of the word estrogen. Now, moisturizers, hyaluronic acid is something that's being looked at in the breast cancer community. Uh, their data is pretty good. I haven't seen any data to say that it pr- prevents urinary tract infections, um, but I'd love to see that data. I haven't seen you know perfect pH data to say that it comes down. Maybe it exists. Um, and so uh, uh, moisturizers and lubricants are nice Band-Aids. Um, I like to fix the problem with vaginal hormones, but um, the Band-Aids are acceptable as well if you're really um, unwilling. But I don't know that it's going to fix the problem. Okay. Does hormone replacement therapy address the vaginal dryness or is that kind of you are asking else. the best questions in the world. So hormone replacement therapy. So hormones for your whole body. So say you're in menopause, you have hot flashes, night sweats, uh, brain fog. Uh, you just, you feel awful. You're not sleeping. And your doctor said, okay, hormone therapy is going to fix all of this. And they give you a patch and they give you a, um, a natural a micronized progesterone a pill. And they say, okay, this is going to fix all of that. I still think that that patient should be very seriously screened for and treated for the genital and urinary problems because often the patch is not enough to get to the vaginal tissue. Mm -hmm. And so for some people it's enough, but I'm very, uh, very quick to add the local therapy because it doesn't add any extra risk. It doesn't add any extra harm and it will, I know it will prevent urinary tract infections. And so that is a really good question. Do you think everyone postmenopause should be on both HRT and local estrogen? So the, I would never say everyone should be on everything. I think giant, I think the, uh, the the reason why I love my job so much is because I get to spend a lot of time with people and really hear their stories and their fears and their histories and their mm-hmm. medical problems. And I get to use what I know about medicine and biology and physiology and, and, and psychology. And I get to say, okay, this is what, with all the data that I know in 2022, this is the thing that I think makes sense for you. Let's talk about it. Mm-hmm. Here's data, here's literature, and let's decide together. Um, I think that hormone therapy in menopause is incredibly underused and there is a lot of fear mongering. And I think people in the UK are doing a kick-ass job of getting the word out and Mm -hmm. being angry and picketing in the streets. I wish I could come picket with you. Like I'm so (laughs) proud of what people are doing in the UK um, because they're, they're getting mad and they should be. And and I would love to see the same things happen in the United States, but it's kind of slow. I think way more people should be on hormones than, than are currently, Mm -hmm. but do I think it's a one, size fits all it is so far from a one size fits all. And the problem that we have in the United States is our doctors are not trained how to properly do menopause care. Uh, there's some data to show that less than 7% of doctors, you know, actually feel like they know how to do menopause care. And so I feel mm-hmm. very lucky that I do, but there's one of me, right? We have yeah. to really do a lot of teaching and training uh, because a lot of people don't do it well and don't know how to do it. Yeah, there are a lot of people that report being taken off HRT for something for a blood clot or for some other kind of illness. But in general, would you say that people should remain on it for the rest of their lives? The type. So the answer, again, I can't say that it it uh, it. The, the, this answer applies to everyone in all situations. The type of hormone matters. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, oral estrogen therapy is much higher risk for blood clots and strokes. And uh, and it's also worse for sexual function. So mm-hmm. I'm not a big fan of oral pills uh, for estrogen. Now, transdermal products seem to be much safer when it comes okay. to blood clots and strokes. So a patch, a ring, a gel seems to be much safer. Um, and so I certainly, it's all about counseling and it's all about, gosh, like I'm a urologist. We deal with men's sexual health all the time. Men and quality of life, it is a given. When a man Mm -hmm. says, I don't want to have this prostate cancer surgery because I want to ejaculate. Our field says, all right, cool. We'll just watch you. Like your body, your choice, you do whatever you want. And we are supportive of that. That's the world I was raised in. And so now I am in the women's health space and I see men about 50% of the time. And I do the same thing. I say, okay, here you have this history. Here's the data we know. Here's what we don't know. Certainly there is some uncertainty, but you know what? It's your body, your choice. Let's make the best informed decision that we can together. and, and, And you get to choose. I, you can never go wrong in that situation, right? Mm-hmm. Like as long as you're well-informed, now will we get more data? As more data comes out, will we analyze it and then look to it and change our opinions? Yeah, but we have to be able to adjust to new information uh, and, and demand new information, which is the most important thing. 
Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you'd like to learn more about this and related topics, be sure to check out our other videos or head over to liveutifree.com. We have some really important articles related to this topic. For instance, we have one on UTI and menopause, one on UTI during pregnancy. We'll also drop those links in the description below. Of course, if you like what we're doing, be sure to hit subscribe and tick the bell so you'll be notified of our future videos. Thanks again for watching and until next time, keep asking questions and pushing for better solutions.